Hey listeners, it's Paul Andriola here. Why not join our community at Small Cap Discoveries where we offer our members direct access to some of the best microcap investment opportunities available. Our members are getting access to premium microcap financings, research reports, and direct access to management. Sign up today at www.smallcapdiscoveries.com. Hi everyone, welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today is September 5th, 2024, and today on our call we have the CEO Dave Robbins from OmniLite Industries. OmniLite trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol OML, and it also trades on the OTC under OLNCF. The company currently trades at $1.18 with about 15 million shares outstanding, or about an $18 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andriola. Uh, thanks a lot, Trevor. Um, great to have Dave with us today. Uh, Omni Light is a company that I know Trevor and I have been following off and on probably for a good oh, seven or eight years. Um, so it's high time that we got caught up with the CEO and, and find out exactly what's going on with the business. Um, so Dave, uh, welcome. Great to have you here. Um, you've got your presentation. I'm just going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Paul and Trevor, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, introduce OmniLite here. So OmniLite is a specialized uh, component manufacturer and a consolidator of component technologies in, in aerospace and defense. We have annualized revenue run rate of around 15 million. Uh, in US dollars, our market cap about 13 million. We're profitable, we're generating cash and have no debt. So OmniLite has been in business since the mid '90s and established itself, you know, over the years as a world-class manufacturer of some highly engineered fastener components for advanced aircraft. The company was very profitable and invested in capital equipment, you know, in order to scale. In 2018, the company, you know, sort of reestablished itself to fulfill the demand for aerospace components, which was at its peak at the time and to fill the need for a mid-tier manufacturing entity with a technology breadth and scale. The company acquired Monzai Company uh, Corp, a company I founded in 2012 to bring RF Center Electronics to the defense marketplace. And through this transaction, I got involved in OmniLite. Shortly thereafter, we recommitted our corporate focus on application-specific components for aerospace and defense where profit margins were better and away from sort of commodity components. In 2022, we acquired DP Cast, a company with a long heritage manufacturing specialized components for jet engines, amongst other things. Recent milestones include qualifying a complete blind fastener component family on Boeing and Airbus and qualifying a GAN sensor component on a missile defense platform. The, you know, I like to think of it, the investment uh, opportunity for OmniLite is really anchored in three areas. You know, we're well positioned to, to continue to gain market share in a robust outlook aerospace and defense market that has high barriers to entry and switching costs, you know, for competitive pressures. It's a good place. Uh, we have a profitable business model, even with varying production volumes, have relatively low CapEx needs intrinsically and from prior investment and have significant operating leverage. And thirdly, the consolidation opportunities to grow is backdrop by a fertile landscape of targets and the continued industry's call for a mid-tier manufacturer. OmniLife's basic business model is a process that starts with customer engagement to fill a need, something that is not as, you know, something not easy to find in the marketplace and a usually an important functional part. Through reputation or demonstration, we can result in a small order to design a small number of products that will be produced, then qualified and tested to perform as required. After qualification comes production and, to, and parts to be used in the field. The time cycle for this generally runs a minimum of 12 months, but more often 18 to 24 months. And the reason I refer to this as a flywheel it's a successful trip around the wheel leads to another opportunity to develop another product. And there are too many needs for specialized components and increasingly too few suppliers with these specialized skills and certifications. And a large 
part of our business is going back, you know, to the well, to the same customers over and over, but additionally looking for new customers that have, you know, similar platform. So we, we focus our attention on product needs that are aligned with system technology needs, trends. Two dominant, you know, you know, two dominant themes are de demand for longer lived and higher performance, as well as lower cost and further range of performance. So examples of this is, you know, we have a blind fastener component and a GAN sensor electronics that address these needs. So a little about the landscape, you know, uh, again, being largely uh, not not completely, but a large preponderance of for is commercial aerospace and defense. So on the commercial aerospace side, you can see, you know, from the graph that, you know, we haven't completely come back to 2018 levels, but we're close to 2019 levels and projected to grow beyond. Um, and even more so uh, today than it was back in 2018, it needs suppliers like Omnilight, Omnilight um, for a variety of reasons, but um, there's, there's a shortage of suppliers, domestic su suppliers for one. And the second is the, the higher efficiency platforms that are dominating builds right now have a large, uh, uh, have a larger content of highly engineered fasteners, these specialty kind of components of which OmniLight plays and less of the commoditized. So, you know, we feel pretty good about the where the commercial airspace market is. It, it wasn't easy coming through COVID, but um, pretty good outlook. And on the defense side, uh, although the budget, you know, there is a growing budget, there is some talk about you know how robust that budget may be but regardless our components that we're, that we're supplying to the defense market are a little bit disconnected with the growth uh in the market there they address needs that are for uh public safety and security uh and worldwide uh conditions that are you know driving things like missile defense and uh, other security uh, measures and you know uh, the the instability in the world is is driving a lot of um, demand there and a lot of modernization of systems and uh, so in the backdrop of a growing market but as well just the the modernization effort is uh, you know is a good opportunity for uh, uh, for OmniLight and. We're on several programs of record, uh, you know, in the defense system uh, systems area, you know, you, you get on programs and and they have a long, long life, uh, typically, you know, measured in decades, not not even years. So we're on a number of, of well-named um, uh, programs, including PAC-3, Patriot, Long Longbow, some surface-to-air missile systems. So, um, you know, we're, we're well positioned um, to have more content on those types of systems. Our customer profile, we, you know, we are still, you know, a smaller uh, supplier, um, but we're dealing with the top OEMs, the, the top OEMs and system integrators. Again, because our focus is on these, you know, specialty components, um, you know that have and they're they're the ones that are making the most sophisticated um, systems. So we're working with uh, you know the Lockheed's, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, uh, TriMass, and Helmet uh, on the commercial side and others. But um, you know Pratt Whitney, Embraer um, are are some others that um, you know make up the the majority of our our business. So some of the challenges facing component manufacturing is number one, and something that really COVID, it was a problem before COVID and COVID really kicked it into a higher gear is that larger footprint manufacturers have a real problem. They have skilled labor uh, shortages, training, 
is is hard, uh, and and so they they really are have have a capacity problem. It's leading to a lot of log jams in uh, in the in the supply chain, and you know frankly they're looking to outsource because they can't keep up. So um, you know that's that's a challenge for for uh, anybody in manufacturing, but our smaller footprint ag agility is really able to now take market share from these uh, larger footprint manufacturers that have, you know, lead times in excess of 52 weeks. Additionally, the industry really is looking for fewer suppliers, really, because managing a supply chain that is, you know, has a lot of depth is difficult. Um, it's difficult to manage just a few. So they're looking for more out-of-the-box solutions, more higher levels of integration, you know, a, a supplier that can do more, but but not have the lead times of these very large manufacturers. And 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 lastly, it is the uh, you know th there's a need for onshore. Uh, you know, starting back in the uh, uh, 2010 and beyond, there was a real push in aerospace, not so much in defense, um, to to look to the Far East for production. And um, I think with supply chain bottlenecks, with the instability in the world, it's now come full circle where, you know, you need, especially with these uh, specialty components, that you, you need an onshore, you need a domestic supplier. So those are the, the challenges. And, and we're positioning ourselves to really be, meet, you know, meet these challenges and leverage from them. So a little bit exactly what we do. So in our metal forming business, you know, we transform high strength wire stock into complex shaped fastener components. And we, how we do it is we, you know, we use uh, a, an automated multi-station forming equipment with a lot of advanced sensors in it. So specialized sensors that are added to that um, so that we can produce, you know, tens of thousands of parts uh, daily and uh, and do it where they're the same, you know, the quality of every part is uh, is the consistency. So, you know, that's a that's a, a secret, a secret sauce, if you will, is is how to do that with these, you know, multi-station forming equipment. Um, but we have, you know, decades really at this point of uh, producing that. And of course, it's to fulfill, you know, the hundreds of millions of high strength fastener components consumed annually. Um, and, and if you want to break it down into, you know, tens of millions that are these really the specialty, the high, highly engineered. So, you know, we have the capacity to fulfill a significant portion of, of that, uh, you know, high strength fastener components, what I call the engineering fasteners. On the investment casting, you know, we transform, you know, high strength molten metal into complex shaped jet engine components. Um, you know, a jet engine is a, you know, very, very highly engineered uh, structure. It has a lot of crazy shapes, whether it's fluid handling, whether it's structural in there, it has to ha handle high temperature. So uh, casting is, is, is sometimes the only way you're going to make a complex shaped part that can work and be rugged uh, in that environment. So we use a automatic, uh, automated loss wax uh, casting process called investment casting. Uh, it involves engineering tooling and, and full robotics. And we're producing, you know, on the range of tens of parts per hour. But at that, at that rate, uh, these are, these are more expensive parts, uh, obviously, but at that rate, you know, their you know jet engine production is you know is what it is, and and uh, we have the capacity to at least um, on some of these really specialty components uh, be a player in that in that market at that at that rate. And uh, you know, again, there's there is needs for millions of high strength components in the production of of, of military and commercial jet engines, and and we focus on you know a niche in there which is the ones that are really uh thin walled in many cases 
and very complex shapes that are you know in, impossible to really produce in any other way. In our microelectronics, you know, we design RF and microwave sensor electronics and, and subcomponents. Uh, we do this with uh, you know integrating into in what's called heterogeneous manufacturing. And it, it, it produces a functional electronic part that can be produced, you know, in hundreds of, you know, hundreds of parts, you know, per hour or day and, um, and has the function of, of, uh, of something that isn't easily duplicated with, uh, let's say a single chip solution. So, um, and, and, this is done for predominantly power systems that have needs like for size, weight, and power, like like a missile or a UAV, with its specialized, um, you know, specialized needs for sensors. Uh, you know, in any system today, any advanced mobile system, communication system is uh, very sensor rich. So, so we're addressing the need for the these types of uh, of sensors. So a little financial snapshot, um, you know, where we've, you know, since 2022 or 10 quarters, we, we've been running at a, uh, at a 47% uh, compound annual growth rate. Uh, that's a combination of uh, organic and acquisition. The DP cast acquisition was in that time frame, uh, and represents, um, what what uh, I'm going to get to in a bit, which is our goals, our our growth rate goals. It's a, a snapshot in time that uh, you know we're looking to reproduce. So we we um, we're showing profit profitable EBITDA, and uh, as you can see, back in in 22, um, there was uh, we weren't we were investing in DP cast at that point, and there was a little bit of recovery from. Uh, from COVID involved there, but um, we're now running where we uh, in in a zone where we expect to, which is uh, you know profitable EBITDA and and converting that to free cash, you know being a you know not a very capex intensive business. There is some, but um, so we expect and uh, produce you know a lot of cash from you know proportional to you know, our profitability. So our aspiration or goals are to, you know, from a revenue point of view, there's the opportunity to grow uh, from the dynamics that that uh, I mentioned earlier is there's a shortage of suppliers, domestic suppliers. There's, uh, you know, our competition is is very large footprint manufacturers that are very slow and not that agile. So there's an opportunity and we've set our goals to, you know, double revenue every three to four years. Um, and with that, again, focusing on, on these high performance uh, specialty components, they, sh they should have a gross margin in the 50% range and an adjust, which translates to an adjusted EBITDA margin of 25%. And, um, you know, these are our goals. We work towards it, um, you know, every day looking for opportunities and, um, and, and have been very, uh, you know, recently we've, you know, it's, we've had, had a pretty good, pretty good run and then, and, and uh, we're, we're, we're looking to continue this trend. So I, I think that's, uh, you know, ending with is that, you um, you know, we focus on, you know, being a profitable growth, a profitable growth and uh, translate that to shareholder returns. Fantastic, Dave, thank you. Um, a question that comes to mind right off the top of my head is um, you're US based. I, I obviously I imagine the majority of your revenue comes from uh, US customers, but do you get international customers as well? Yeah, we actually do have a significant amount of uh, international uh, considering. Uh, and one of our DP cast is in Canada. They're in Brampton, Ontario. So their mix is uh, probably 60-40 uh, Canadian to U.S. 
But, um, you know, especially in the defense side of things, there is uh, a, a number, almost exclusively the international is defense related and, and not uh, commercial aerospace, mm -hmm. but on some named uh, international program for, for defense. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, can you give us a sense, like the platform you have now in the various uh, companies and products and services, what what, what do you see as an addressable market for, for those products? Well, it, it, it's, uh, I mean, that's a good, it's a good question. As, as much as we can handle, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, 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 if, if that makes any sense, it's, um, I mean, it, it, it's to say if if we wanted to try to stay within let's say the the specialty components that we currently have you know it's it's at least you know hundreds of millions of dollars it's it's a very large market gotcha gotcha and then um okay so you you're, you're profitable your cash positions uh growing here and you also have some shares in uh, cal california nanotech um can can investor expect that that use of capital is going to go towards M and A, or is there other uses of that capital? I would say that the disproportionate amount would be towards M and A. That's part of our growth strategy, um, and uh, there's opportunity there. So yes, that would be the disproportionate. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and it, it maybe give us a sense of the sort of pipeline. What what what. Either what what are you looking for in a business that acquires is it? Is it technology? Is it customers? Is it geography? What can you tell us there? So a, a big piece would be technology. So mm -hmm. as I mentioned, um, you know, there's an industry call for for a bigger, a mid, what I call a mid-tier manufacturer. So you know, for the last 20 years, it's it's been decimated through consolidation. What's left is large footprint manufacturers and tiny, I'll call them mom pa manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And and they may be something more than that, but they're still small. So a, a technology is is number one, probably, but one A is customer. So mm -hmm. a good example of that would DP cast. Had had a uh, a customer of uh, Pratt Whitney, mm -hmm. which didn't exist before in, within OmniLight before that, so that was a very uh, the value of that relationship uh, was very large as well as the technology that that came along with with uh, casting. So mm -hmm. uh, those two those two factors, um, you know, are 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 one and one A. Mm -hmm. And, and just in general, like what, what's happened within the industry? I, I mean, defense spending never seems to go down, um, but the airline industry, where are we in the sort of the cycle? I always sort of picture it as being somewhat cyclical and there's almost a refresh cycle or whatever you want to call it. Where do you think we are in both those industries right now? So in... Uh... I, there's projections, pretty well projections that you know have come out that that have are projecting a, a fairly robust commercial air transport. Um, again, getting back to uh, 2019 levels, uh, not yet at the high water mark, but uh, new aircraft builds. Uh, the demand is there. Uh, you know, I, I think it's tempered a little bit um, through the ability of this. You know, the supply chain is really holding back the the build rates at this point it's not it's not consumer demand mm -hmm. so i i think the outlook for commercial air transport you know is 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 pretty good but you know e even if and and it's from the demand side it's very good and i think if if it's going to be tempered it it's going to be tempered by the fact that the supply chain will continue mm -hmm. to to hamper it a bit mm -hmm. but you know, we're, we're, our growth strategy is not just directly related to build rates. A piece of it is, mm. more of it is related to us capturing more components. For example, uh, you know, a, a year ago, a little over a year ago, I announced that we had a small order for a new component. Mm. And uh, part of the revenue bump that we've gotten in this past two quarters has been directly related to that small order 
that we received a year and a half ago. So to some to some extent, our, our commercial aerospace growth is coming from new new components, not not just the growth of the overall. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. And on the defense side, yeah. the same thing. I, I I question whether defense, total defense spending will really be as robust. I know it keeps going up, the, the rate is slowing. But uh, but again, our content is more on modernization mm -hmm. and new advanced systems that are addressing real time needs. Um, and, and so we're, we're somewhat decoupled, uh, you know, from the actual growth rates in mm -hmm. those markets. And, you know, it's driven, unfortunately, it's driven by world, you know, world conditions today. Mm -hmm. And um, and and that doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, true enough. Um, you mentioned supply chains. Maybe, maybe talk a little bit about your supply chains or your the raw material that you get. Um, any, any issues around that? Where, where do you get your raw materials? What is your raw materials you typically use? So, you know, being focused on aerospace and defense, you really have to be careful. So we, we have very limited suppliers, but they're all domestic. Mm -hmm. So we don't source anything uh, outside of, of the U.S. or Canada, for that matter. And generally, it's with the same, you know, the raw material suppliers that, you know, they have to go through a lot of qualification. Uh, counterfeit material is a, is a big deal in, mm -hmm. in both, um, you know, commercial air transport and defense. So, you know, we've spent a long, you know, you know, all the time, really, we've spent on qualifying our suppliers, both on where where they source their material and the qualification, so we're uh, you know we think we're refined around the best raw material suppliers, and we other than uh, back in twenty twenty two and twenty three, we did get hit a little bit with some long lead on some some steels and and uh, and specialty. It wasn't that we couldn't get it, but the lead times were twenty six thirty six weeks. Mm. Uh, we did a little planning ahead and we bought, we hedged and, and we bought some wire, for example, um, and, and we put it into inventory. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we think we have a pretty good handle on that, um, of course, and, and backdrop by staying with staying with domestic suppliers and mm. not, not be tempted to to stray outside that. Mm -hmm. And then um, what what's a competitive landscape look like? Um, I, I, you know. Are there a lot of large competitors? Are there a lot of small competitors? You kind of touched on mom and pop type of operations. What what's the competitive landscape look like? Well, the competitive landscape is is mostly, I would say, you know, dominant. And there may be, you know, in the different areas we have, you know, casting has a different set of competitors. Although in some cases, they're these large footprint. You know, they can do casting, they can do forming electronics, you know, I, I would characterize it by, you know, there's tens, you know, there isn't a hundred, um, but there's, and but but these are billion dollar companies. Mm -hmm. we're, we're competing with, when I say large footprint, you know, the, these are not, uh, these are very, very large companies. So it's hard for me to even really look to see a, a, comp a competitor that's even remotely our size. So we're, we're, we're small player, um, but but competing with uh, a small number of very large uh, companies, I I would say that there are some niche applications where there may be a very small company um, that we're competing with, um, but you know in a very narrow scope, in, mm -hmm. a, in a very narrow area, and mm -hmm. and and there may be you know one of those companies might be an acquisition target. Um, if if uh, and and it may not be a competitor, but it may be a complementary type uh, company that's doing something related, um, but not exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you touched on a few ideas, but if from an investor's viewpoint, what what kind of direction do you want to take the business in terms of new initiatives or new technologies, new products? Is there is there an area that you want to focus on? Well, I think the area to, to focus on is is we well expanding the breadth a bit, but staying mm -hmm. within the zone of high performance specialty components, uh, and and not drift into at all the commodity marketplace. So, 
commodity marketplace uh, has a lot of pressures. It has a lot of numbers, but um, but but uh, you know a different landscape. But additionally, is uh, when I when I mentioned in the you know the part about uh, sort of the challenges, I mentioned that you know out, more out of the box solutions. So for example, you know we move up the food chain instead of a, a component, uh, a single component. There may be a component uh, array that's mm -hmm. considered a, a subsystem. It's still the same basic function, but slightly up the the food chain for its functionality. Um, it's not a major step. It would it would employ the same basic manufacturing, mm -hmm. um, you know, conditions that we have. So we're not looking to take on, you know, by doing that to take on a whole lot of risk. Mm -hmm. Stay within our manufacturing competencies, um, but but move up the food chain a bit. Would mm -hmm. uh, where where can they can even have a, a, a profitability expansion if you're a little higher up that food chain? Mm -hmm. It just dawned on, it dawned on me. Like, how, how do you how do you decide what products to make? Is it is it are there RFPs or customers coming to you and saying, "Hey, we need this widget built," or are you coming out there and saying, "Here's a new widget"? How how do products even come to fruition? Yeah. So that's that's what my flywheel slide was about. Is that it uh, you know being a specialty manufacturer you know we we need to drive customer engagement because uh, afterwards can, usually there's can, a free for all i can say that uh that it's customers do come to us but it's uh it's a symbiotic relationship because you don't put things on aircraft you don't put things on missile systems you don't put things like that you know where there's a high risk so there, there's a pretty close customer relationship, but it and it starts with engagement, um, and and so 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 it's it's equal parts us you know staying in front of the customer looking for their uh, pain points honestly right they have a they have a problem they need a component we're there to develop something from them for them and. And sometimes they'll, they'll they will come to us knowing that we have a reputation. So that's that's really you know again on the acquisition side, a target would be somebody who has a good reputation that can help promote new business. Um, as a general Perfect. rule. Perfect. Um, I usually have to remind everybody to to ask questions, but it looks like everybody's got a bunch of questions lined up here. So I'm going to jump on some of these if that's okay. Um, We've got Hassan that's asked about patents. Can you talk about the company's patents, if any? We have a few patents on the uh, metal forming side that go back to uh, the very origins of the company. And the I spoke to, about it briefly in the ability to take a multi-die forming machine, um, which on its own is pretty complex. But there's a patent on how to actually use sensors and, um, you know, without getting into the details of it, to modify that piece of equipment to do some very specialty things that allow you to make very complex shaped in three dimensions. So it could be complex shaped in two dimensions, but, um, you know, so there, there's a number of patents around metal forming that allow you to produce complex shaped and many in, in a high rate of speed, you know, with, with, with automation um, is probably the, the, the one area that we have a, a significant number of patents and, uh, and, and casting and electronics um, don't um, no, no patents that uh, mm -hmm. are of any, any substance. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, Hassan asks, uh, what is the impact of Boeing's troubles um, on your business? Any impact from Boeing and some of the some of the issues there? Well, in a sense, you know, there is uh, in a sense there's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's highlighting the fact that there are supplier and supply chain issues. So, in that sense, it's uh, it's an opportunity for 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 us. Um, but on the same token. Um, you know, if build rates slow, um, you know, that there is a trickle effect. Now, we on the commercial air transport side, we are not agnostic. You know, we're agnostic to most platforms. So the type of fastener components we make are on all 
the the newer models. So so you know for example you know we we're not let's say seven three seven you know we have parts on the seven three seven but not exclusive to the seven three seven. These are specialty components that you need anywhere where you have a a, a plane that uses the advanced composites, you know, for, for greater range. Uh, these, these blind fasteners are used, you know, in those areas on multiple platforms. So, uh, so we are affected like everybody else by Boeing's troubles, but not in an inordinate way and not related to any particular platform. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And then uh, Dave, what, uh, what segment of the business excites you the most? Well, they, they, they all do because, uh, you know, I'm excited about, um, you know, the whole, you know, I say aerospace and defense, um, you know, they're connected, even though commercial air transport is, you know, technically separate and distinct from, mm -hmm. from defense, but they're very related in the sense that, um, you know, you, 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 you've, they're important platforms that, you know, if something goes wrong, you know, bad things happen, right? So mm -hmm. I'm excited about continuing to put uh, advanced components on these on these kind of platforms because you know we we see we see um, you know the, the you know those the world is looking to be more sensor rich, more communication. Uh, you you want vehicles to go farther. You you want you know planes to have more range. You want your to be protected. So, uh, you know, and I, th I think, you know, th and that goes to our thesis of these specialty components and our, in our, as we acquire new technologies is ones that are in that still make that zone. Cause that, that's what excites me is the, is building these, these specialty high performance components. Cause you know, we see future needs, more needs, mm -hmm. maybe fewer, fewer numbers in a sense, but, higher value in those um in those systems so uh equally on 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 all all three aspects of our you know manufacturing are equally mm -hmm. excited mm -hmm. perfect um do, do your customers um especially like the airline manufacturers do, do they pay on time like what, what's kind of the you know the, the payment schedule for a lot of these customers so uh, I would I would characterize it. This is the uh, the the one negative to international is that they tend to pay a little, a little slower. But I would have to say we have been very fortunate because we're really only dealing with the tier one and maybe a few tier two mm -hmm. uh, OEMs. I mean they they have they pay because mm -hmm. they they need our they they need our components. So and and generally they're pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yeah, so we haven't had uh, really many payment. Our, our DSO is uh, uh, pretty reasonable. And, and, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I have, I sleep at night not worrying about, um, you know, our customers paying. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's a question I usually ask. What keeps you up at night? So we know it's not that. What, what sort of challenges are you, are you, do you face as a, as a business right now? Well, I, 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 right now, I think the the people re retaining and uh, training new people um, is still, you know, in manufacturing because there is there is, it's it's not something that um, a lot of people are running towards. Mm -hmm. So we put a lot of energy into thinking about how to retain the talent that we have, but also to promote, to hire, and train new talent. Because as and it's not it's 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 a highly skilled labor. Um, you know, we as a, as a company, we're we use a, a lot of automation and automation is, uh, you know, on one hand, you can think of automation as a way of being less dependent on on people. But it's a little counterintuitive in a way you're more because the few the, the fewer you need fewer people, but the fewer people you need need to be very highly trained and qualified. So, um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not losing sleep, but I think about it a lot and uh, I, I do a lot because it's a real challenge today. Um, you know, it's a real challenge today to, and, and if we have growth, which we're expecting growth, that means I got We have to keep that pipeline open mm -hmm. and robust. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. 
And speaking of growth, like, do, do you see more growth coming from, uh, call it new customers, or is it predominantly old customers, or you're you're selling more products to? How do you, how do you view well, that? Well, yeah, it's it's uh, new customers. Uh, you know, there there they will be. There's a concerted effort to have new customers, although it's a slow cycle, because uh, you know you, you're going to start a new customer. It's going to be a component or maybe a couple of components, and then it's going to be prove yourself uh, again in our market where where it has to be high performance, has to be quality, it can't fail. Um, it has to go through that cycle. So any new customer you have is going to be, you know, the road to where that customer is doing anything meaningful is probably three to five years. Mm. So more of our, and, and, and we're looking to do that, and we've done some, uh, groundbreaking there but majority is is to uh more more components on mm -hmm. our with our existing customers mm -hmm. uh, is 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 really the, the yeah. focus. And, and and really the sense i get these are highly specialized products these are not commodity products it's not like you're making you know standard nails or anything like this you're making pretty significantly mission critical sort of specialized products correct correct yeah yeah perfect um, okay, so another question. On average, how long does it take Omni Light to fill an order from time of contract to signed? Okay, so there's 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 uh so leveraging off your your other you know your other question. So once you're qualified and you're producing a part and we've been producing it for you know many cases years, we could fulfill an order of that type mm -hmm. uh, in in weeks. And and the reason is is because the demand is 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 so well known mm -hmm. that uh, effectively we we put parts in stock, and and the, and it's not that we want to, but you know it's an industry trend with with the problems with 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 bottlenecks, um, in, and planning problems. It's almost the expectation we've gotten into this. This um, and it's been this way probably going back to even 2018. That uh, the expectation is that suppliers on these programs where you're already qualified, that you um, you have products virtually in stock. If if we didn't, and it was a made to order, it it would be, it would be in the uh, probably about two months uh, to build. You know to to or, mm -hmm. or maybe a little less. But the reality is that. A lot of it is 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 almost out of stock, mm -hmm. and if we do build it, it's it's within a quarter's time. So it's a fairly short cycle because it's already been designed, it's already been qualified, um, and 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 really the cycle is really getting it on a machine. It's not mm -hmm. how long it produced, but it's finding the finding the capacity. Right. Now to turn an order for something that's new is that cycle is is a year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that 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 flywheel that I was was meant to depict that, um, and it's everything from um, the initial, you know, the design related things because as as we were saying, these are all custom, very customized kind of specialized things. They have customized drawings, um, and and that you that cycle to produce even a few prototypes, uh, and then get ready where you to to the point where you could produce them parts that will use in the field is typically a year mm. and and can be you know more like 18 months to to, to two years gotcha um okay so so trevor says uh, a lot of the raw materials used in stainless steel and exotic metals are generally sourced from abroad uh could this be a problem for you guys going forward well again we we source our stainless all, steels are all, all domestic okay. uh now our our suppliers may some of the raw material that we're getting them from, uh, you know, may ultimately be sort like titanium mm -hmm. may ultimately become. But there's there's uh, you know we we go through uh, domestic suppliers mostly because of the concern about uh, about what's called conflict, you know, either uh, counterfeit. Materials where it's uh, 
Um, you know, it's really not titanium, but it's titanium with other impurities mixed into it. And somehow that gets into the supply chain. So in a sense, because we're putting stuff on aircraft, because we're putting stuff on missiles, the reality is we don't, if, if we want to be viewed and, and be a responsible supplier, they're expecting us to only use a couple of suppliers. So we really don't have a lot of choice, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and we stay that way because reputation, when you're putting stuff on aircraft, reputation is, uh, is, is, is everything. Yeah. And I mean, what, what, what happens when something goes wrong? Is there, like, if one of your, you know, your products, doesn't live up to standard or, or, or something like that. Is, is there insurance issues? Is there, is there a lot of liability that you guys carry in the event that something goes wrong? Well, we do carry insurance, but again, we're not launching. Typically the real liability lies in the system integrator at the very top. There's an awful lot of qualification that goes, mm -hmm. you know, we're a component manufacturer. So we, we go through a lot of certifications. We go through a lot of testing, uh, like, for example, uh, non-destruct testing, a lot of quality checks along the way. The, these are some of the barriers to entry from, mm -hmm. from a, a small. And that's the reason that a lot of these small manufacturers, uh, you know, have are, aren't around or there aren't. Uh, because the barriers to being able to produce things, there's a lot of testing, there's a lot of know-how, inspection, so, and it sounds, it sounds like it's just very, very rare. So by the time it gets to the, to the highest level, the OEM, it's been a lot of, a lot of eyeballs on it. And, oh, and checks. now I do hear where sometimes that has happened with smaller companies that skip steps, but, um, and then there's a rigorous process of, of called, you know, failure analysis and, uh, and a lot of processes around that. And we haven't had to go through that because, um, if 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 we've had a problem, it's generally been in the engineering side, right in the beginning and during qualification, and not in, not in production. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. Appreciate it. Um, so, you know, one of the questions comes around the CNO shares that you have or the Cal Nano shares. Um, how, how like what's your intentions with those shares? Um, clearly, if you're going to do acquisition, you may need uh, you know access uh, to further capital. How can we sort of understand what what the long term plans are with the, those shares? So you know, I, I've I've said it you know publicly that you know this has been a, a, a very good investment for for Omni Light and it mm -hmm. probably will continue um, over time. Um, you know, we will, you know, we will convert. But you know, we're we're looking this as a as a as a as a good investment for us, and it will continue to be a good investment. And um, over a long, long period of time, uh, yeah, we would we would look to at the appropriate time, um, you know, uh, convert that to things that you know we could use for acquisitions for SA. But but it's um, you know, but we we wouldn't you know we're not looking to do anything that could uh, that would hurt you know mm -hmm. Cal Nano in any way. It's a, mm -hmm. um, it's a good it's a good investment. It continues to be a good investment, you know, for Omni Life. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, and then just looking forward in terms of acquisitions, and you kind of touched on it just there, but how how do you how do you approach the idea of financing any future acquisitions? Do you, do you think you have the balance sheet to do it? Would you take on debt? Um, you know, equity raises. What 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 can you tell us? Well, so um, well one one of the per, you know anchors of our you know our our. Our business thesis is is our, our cash generation and being profitable, um, uh, you know, one for the source of capital. But um, if you if if you're going to use some debt, then that's a necessary, you know, having a track record of being profitable and cash generation is is a, is a good anchor. But you know, we we would look to be, uh, you know, use use all those levers, you know, in, in the appropriate. They're they're uh, in each deal. Each deal is is different, mm -hmm. um, uh, and 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 you know for the most part, you know we would our our acquisition thesis is going to be that you know they're going to be smaller. You know we're not you know we're not looking to do transformative um, you know type mm -hmm. acquisitions, mm -hmm. smaller digestible, um, you know that have a technology and a customer base that 
you know, could easily be, you know, brought into the, the fold. So, um, you know, a combination of, of some of those levers that you mentioned are, are mm -hmm. most likely uh, our sources of capital. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then just one last question for the audience here is around inflation. Um, we've obviously seen price pressures on a lot of materials and raw products and things like that. How has that affected you guys? Are you guys able to properly pass that through to your customer? We, we have, um, for the most part, not exclusively. Uh, so because we're not on, we're on very few long-term agreements. So within the commercial aerospace business, it's very common to have long-term agreements. And long-term agreements can be good, but they can be, if they don't have inflation uh, escalators, uh, you know, they can be problematic. Mm -hmm. So we, we've been able to pass on, for the most part, we've been able to pass on other than one LTA that is, is going to be up in, in 2025. And that has been, uh, has had an effect. Um, you know, inflation has had an effect on that. And 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 thankfully we uh you know we 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 have a very you know it's only one LTA. We're gonna look to either get out okay, um or generary you know escalators in there or price that price that in for that mm -hmm. very reason. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because it's it's a real issue, you know, going forward. Mm -hmm. and, and Dave, um I mean, I, I I think anybody who looks at your stock or your business um, can appreciate you've got you've got a healthy little business here. Uh, some would argue maybe undervalued. You're out there looking for acquisitions, but how about if the tables are turned? Um, do, do you ever have people knocking on your door looking to acquire you? Or are you guys interested in potentially uh, putting yourselves up for sale? How do you how do we look at that? Well, I I think by its nature, if we're if we're growing and we're putting uh you know advanced components on a, on a lot of these platforms and growing we will naturally be i you know a target so uh you know having been involved with a a small public in my past um it, it's what can happen and you know as a shareholder and a you know ceo of the company is that uh, you know it's it's not that you're looking for, but it's not that you're uh, not looking for, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you know I would be open to anything that uh, you know looked like it, it was in a in a for share you know for the shareholders. Um, uh, you know I we we wouldn't you know we're not looking to not or or not looking mm -hmm. to, but we would we would look at that you know in a positive way, and I would expect. As we grow, that we will, we would be on some target lists. It would surprise me if we mm -hmm. weren't. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, and you know, mention the stock there. Um, maybe give us a sense of the insider ownership as a percentage, or uh, any other sort of significant shareholders of note. So insiders, are, you know, are about twenty five percent. They're. they're widely held outside of that you know it, we do have you know some small institutional ownership um but it's it's fairly widely held and and i wouldn't say any particular owner know that i can you know say anything about mm -hmm. gotcha fair enough um okay so just sort of in, in in closing here what what do you think as investors you know watching the business what do you think are the either catalysts or maybe key metrics that we should pay the most attention to to see that you guys are you know executing in the right direction? Well, I I I, I would say focus on you know that that the profitability trajectory. You know we've been on a path. You know we have a little bit of a history here, but we've been on a path and watch watch that. You know revenue can you know bounce. To be growing, you know, so and profitability, you know, of of the health of of Omni Light. We manage our business, and it's a good it's a good measure. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think you know recently is more dem demonstrative of demonstrates where 
you know, the zone that we're looking to be. Yeah, no, good. And then Dave, any, any last message, anything that you think we should sort of focus on in the past? Maybe we didn't, but any key message you want to want, make sure everybody walks away with today? No, I just, uh, you know, the, I guess the, the key message that, you know, that we, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're in a, we think we're in a, a market that has is underserved and that our competencies and our ability to manufacture are, are you know, is, is a great opportunity for us to, to continue to grow profitably. So, uh, simple message, but um, you know, keep going back to the basics. The <laughs> basics, exactly what we love. Yeah, um, no, love it. Um, excellent. Well, listen, we've been speaking with CEO Dave Robbins of OmniLight Industries, a symbol OML on the Venture Exchange. Uh, Dave, it was great to catch up today, and, and we certainly look forward to catching up in the in the future. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. Yeah.